Yeah. Yeah, some, some, somebody's got to help me to get to this next level in God. Paul says, Paul says, I'm coming. He says, I'm coming to impart this spiritual gift to you. Paul says, I wanted to get there before now. He says, but I've been so busy with the ministry assignments that God has given to me. He says, I just haven't been able to get there. Now, this is critical when you hear Paul say this. And you say, Pastor Malone, why is it critical? Let me remind you again that Paul did not birth this church. He did not start this church. He was not the founder of the church at Rome. Paul started the church at Corinth. Paul started the church at Thessalonica. And there are other churches that the apostle started on his missionary journey. Paul was on three missionary journeys. And as he combed all of Asia Minor, he started churches in just about every city that he went to. But he did not start the church at Rome. And so if he had started the church at Rome, you could easily understand why he would be saying and speaking of these concerns but the fact that he did not start this church speaks volumes because that means Paul is concerned about a church for whom he did not have personal responsibility for giving birth to and that means that Paul understood that the kingdom of God is bigger than any one church Paul understood that no one church has the capacity to expand the kingdom of God as God desires for it to happen in the world. Paul wanted these Christians at Rome to understand that there is a spiritual connection between you and the church at Philippi, between you and the church at Thessalonica, between you and the church at Colossus, between you and the church at Ephesus, between you and the churches of Galatia, the church at Berea. He's trying to help them understand that churches all over the country, all over the world are connected because all of us are part of the body of Christ he wants to understand in his concern that even as I come he says the focus is not on Paul the focus is on Jesus Christ I'm not coming to make a name for myself but I'm coming to exalt the name that is above every name that I'm coming to minister to you in the spirit of Jesus Christ and child of God I tell you in the time in which we live more of us need to hear what Paul said to the church at Rome because why is it today that so many churches of various denominations cannot work together for the cause of Christ. I want you to know that God is bigger than any denomination. Uh, Jesus didn't start a denomination. Jesus started the kingdom. We started denominations. Oh, I'm going to say it again. Jesus didn't start one denomination. What he started was the kingdom. We started denominations. Yeah, Pastor Malone, what denomination are you a part of? Well, I pastor what they would call a Baptist church, you see. But as far as I'm concerned, the kingdom is bigger than Baptist. I preach for, I preach for the Pentecostals, Assemblies of the World. I preach for the Church of God in Christ. I preach for the Assemblies of God. I preach for the African Methodist Episcopal. I preach for the African Methodist Episcopal Zions. I preach for the Episcopalians. I preach for the Lutherans. I preach for foot, 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 foot washing Baptists. I preach for the Catholics. I preach for non-denominational I preach for E.T. if he shows up because the kingdom is bigger than any denomination if somebody asks me who I am I'm a Christian that's who I am I'm a Christian and, that's, and perhaps that's why we can't work together because too many of us have lost sight what it's all about Perhaps we can't work together because two men for ego tripping and rather than exalting his name, we're trying to exalt and build a name for ourselves. And I ask you, child of God, how can the church be a fragmented fellowship and then make a maximized witness for a united Christ to a marginalized world? We got to learn how to come together. We got to learn how to be one. We got to learn what spiritual solidarity is all about. I've been passing for over 30 years and in my pastoral ministry I've seen people who could not serve unless they were out front somewhere. They couldn't serve unless they were in a visible position. They couldn't serve unless they were somewhere where somebody was going to call their name, recognize them and give them a plaque. Can't sing in the choir unless they're being a lead singer. They don't know how to be a good backup. You see, and what that means is that it ain't about us. It ain't about God, but rather it's all about us. But if in fact 
fact, we are called to serve him. Then it doesn't matter where you serve, you just want God to get the glory. You just want God to get the glory. Paul, Paul, Paul says it has to do with my motivation. Everyone just shout motive. Yeah, our motivation. Why are we doing what we are doing? What is the reason behind what we are doing? And listen, if you ever want to know what a person is like, you really don't have to spend three hours studying their biographical sketch or their Vita curriculum or their resume. If you really want to know what a person is like, all you got to do is see how they handle people, positions, and power. Because however a person handles people, position and power, that'll tell you more about them than anything else. You see, my dears, here's a reason for you to scream. You see, a rumor and a reputation is what other folks say about you. But character is who you really are. I said a rumor and a reputation is what others say about you. But character is who you really are. And what, what, what Paul is urging us in this text is, is, is to be authentic in our relationship with God and to be authentic in our relationship with one another. But not only did Paul speak to them about his credentials and his concern, but then finally Paul spoke to them about his confidence. Paul, Paul, Paul says, I am dead of both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Paul says, I'm a dead of both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. Paul says, I feel a heaviness in my spirit. He says, there is a spiritual urgency in my life. There is a must about my ministry. I've got to share the gospel with as many people as I can because I understand how precious the gift of salvation is. And I would to God that the church of the, of the living God today would feel an urgency to share the gospel and to bring as many people on God's side as we could. Paul says, I'm ready to preach the gospel in Rome. He says, I understand that Rome is the citadel of political power. I understand that in Rome that the emperor expects everyone to say curios Caesar and not curios Christ Paul says I understand that it's dangerous to preach the gospel in Rome he says I understand that you can become a martyr for preaching the truth of the gospel in Rome he says I understand that there have been people who have gotten there before me who are false teachers and who have told lies about me who said I'm twisting the gospel they're trying to destroy my reputation they're trying to hinder my work even before I get there. He said, but with all of that going on, I'm still ready to preach the gospel in Rome. Look at somebody tell them, say, how ready are you? Yeah, how ready are you? Because you see, my dears, the fact of the matter is that I being a bold Christian for the Lord Jesus Christ is not best witness in the sanctuary. It's best witness in the street. Hey, any of us can raise our hands and say hallelujah here. Hey, any of us can shout and praise God in the sanctuary. Anybody of us can turn to a person in the sanctuary and give them a high five or touch and agree with some spiritual truth. But I want to know what can you do when the benediction is over. I want to know how do you act when you're at home. I want to know where's your witness on the street. I want to know what is your characteristic like on your job. I want to know where you have the same boldness out there as you have here. When you go to your job tomorrow are you going to close up your Bible and put it in the drawer? I want to know when you're having lunch with your co-workers are you going to just start eating or will you stop and give grace? I want to know if somebody starts getting on the nerve that you never had. Will you then go into a posture of prayer and tell them, let me pray for a little while. I want to know, can you talk to your husband as unsaved? Can you talk to your wife who doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus? I want to know, have you given up on that child that's acting so crazy that it seems to be demon possessed? Or will you go kneel by the child's bed and start pleading the blood of Jesus? What I want to know is how ready are you? Come on, tap somebody. Say you are the salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. And 
God expects you to use your salt and he expects you to use the light that you have. He expects you to go out into the society, to go out in the community. The Bible says the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. Yes, the city of refuge and the Canaan Christian church, neither church ought to be growing by popularity, but we ought to be growing by the profession of our faith. Everyone ought to be trying to bring someone to Jesus Christ because we're not serving a God of happenstance and we're not serving an accidental Christ. Paul said, I'm ready to preach the gospel at Rome. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Come on, if you're not ashamed, just tap three people and tell them, I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed. And Paul says, the reason I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ is because it is the power of God to salvation. Yes, the gospel is good news. It is the Greek word euangelion, and it means good news. And in the world like ours, where we are so inundated with bad news, aren't you glad that every now and then that God can give you some good news? And the gospel is is good news and the reason it's good news is because it is the power of God to salvation there is power in the gospel the gospel of Christ has the power to save it's got the power to heal and it's got the power to deliver I said the gospel of Jesus Christ it's got the power to save it's got the power to heal and it's got the power to deliver it will will save you. You remember the woman that was at Jacob's well. She was a prostitute. And you remember Jesus had a conversation with her and said, give me some water. She was amazed that someone who was a rabbi and who was a Jew would ask a Samaritan for some water. Along with the fact that because she was a prostitute, she had a bad reputation. But Jesus said, if you knew who was asking you for the water, you try to give me some water. And then Jesus Jesus went on to tell her about her life, told her about all the men she had been with and said, the one that you're with now ain't your husband. But when Jesus got through talking to her, he brought salvation into her life. He met her where she was, but he didn't leave her where he found her. And then that woman went back in the city and said, come see a man who's told me about all things that I've ever done. And the Bible says that many people People believed on Jesus because of her witness. Have I got anybody here today who knows that the gospel still has the power to save? Not only does it have the power to save, but the gospel has the power to heal. Because you remember the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years and the church had ostracized her from the community of the believers. She couldn't come into the city. She couldn't go to church. She had to stay outside on the outskirts of the city and just cry, I am unclean. But then she heard Jesus. Jesus was coming through and she says he's got what I need and she says I want what he has so bad that I'm getting ready to break protocol I'm getting ready to break the law because as unclean as I am I'm going to make my way back into the city I'm going to make my way to church I may not even get to talk to him but if I can just touch the hem of his garment I believe there's enough healing in the hem of his garment that it will make me whole and when she touched the hem of his garment the infirmity dried up and Jesus said somebody touched me and the disciples said what you mean Jesus we're in a multitude of people we know somebody's bumping up to you on every side and Jesus says I ain't talking about a bump I'm talking about a touch somebody just touched